in that debate with Zizek, um, there was a, a, a piece that we're going to clip out, and but it's part of something I already clipped out of a 15-minute piece of that debate. I talked about the Communist Manifesto as a call to bloody violent revolution. And a significant proportion of the audience, who were obviously pro-Marxist and had come to hear Zizek hopefully defend their hero, um, cheered and laughed when I talked about bloody violent revolution. And, you know, it, it's also the case that once you make the prop... Look, I've, I've been trying to understand, for example, when the left goes too far. You know, where's the cutoff line? It's very difficult to draw. But the problem with the insistence that power structures everything is that as soon as you insist upon that, you justify, you can't help but justify your own use of power. And then that, for me, as a psychoanalytic thinker, let's say, then that makes me suspicious that perhaps that's the motivation for the entire bloody argument. It's like, well, everything's about power, so it's perfectly fine for me to express power in whatever way I see fit, especially if I'm serving the oppressed or I'm serving some higher moral order. But really what I'm trying to do is to find a justification for my expression of naked power. And you can see the enjoyment in the crowd when that phrase about bloody violent revolution popped out. It's like, yes, yes, it's really, that's what you want. And who is it exactly here that's animated by the desire for power? And so, I mean, is the, is the driving force behind the insistence that all our social institutions are based on power, the desire to justify power as a, as a political weapon? That is, that is indubitably a significant part of the attraction, though I think it takes its strength fundamentally morally from the, the, per, the perception that this mode of analysis can help us redress um, well, uh, you insisted, suffering. You ins yeah, you insisted earlier, and I've, I was speaking with someone else who made the same case very recently, I, I can't remember who it was, but it'll come to me, um, you know, that there's no impulse to action without a drive toward the good, but I'm not so sure about that. I think that people can become hurt enough and bitter enough and resentful enough um, so that they are driven by the desire to make things worse, that there, that there isn't a good oh, in oh, mind. Oh, 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 certainly, but that, that that's, I mean, I know absolutely, but I mean there is there's a there's a however misperceived there's some end in the activity. I'm not saying it's 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 a, it's a good move. Why couldn't the end just be like because I've thought about Hitler in this regard too? It's like there's this old psychoanalytic dictum that Jung I believe formulated. I haven't been able to find exactly where he he stated it, unfortunately. But the gist of it is that if you don't understand the motivation for something, you look at the outcome and you infer the motivation. And so then I look at Hitler, and he committed suicide in a bunker after berating Germany for failing to live up to his noble ideal, left the entire country in flames, left the entire continent in ruins in this massive conflagration. He was always interested in the worship of fire. I mean, and so, you know, one interpretation would be that Hitler was attempting to produce, you know, a new world order. Another would be that he was aiming at committing suicide in the midst of Europe in flames. And that was the outcome. And I'm kind of likely to attribute that motivation. You know, you could think about it as a warped attempt to, to pursue the good, you know, in the, in the form of, let's say, an extreme nationalism and, and the binding of a tribe. But to me, it's more shaking his fist at God in the sky and saying, you know, Here's here's my revenge on the world you created, and I don't see a good in, I don't see any drive to good in that except peripherally. Oh sure, so, sure. I'm not I'm not saying I'm certainly not saying that these things are actually good. What I'm saying I know, is that, I know you're not. Yeah, yeah. That the action that the action, however uh, uh, perverse, perceives even if it's just the the perception of the furtherance of the self own will to power. You know, there's a, what I'm saying is it's moved by a perception of an end, and that end may be completely cataclysmic. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, not, it, 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 and frankly, that's why the whole work of education, the whole work of 
of education, of, of parenting, of, of our social institutions aims at, we hope, enlightening or helping the individual to better perceive what is really good. Good, yes. And, and okay, so, so, you know, let me yeah. ask you about that. So I've been thinking psychologically, again, about Christianity. And I know that Christianity is an extension of other metaphysical forms of thought, but that predated. But it looked to me like, and, and some of those were derived from Mesopotamia, and some of them were derived from Greece, and some of them were derived from Judaism and other sources. But they all seem to me to be part of the conversation that human beings have been having amongst themselves for thousands of years about what the nature of the ideal human being is. And you know, I see these cathedrals, these works of art in architecture that took a tremendous amount of labor and produce a dome-like structure that represents the sky, and you see Christ as logos spread out on the sky as a transcendent force. And you ask yourself, well, what exactly is that signifying? And the answer is at least the proposition of a kind of ideal that's associated with, let's say, universal love and truth in speech. That's the logos in, summed up in two phrases. And if there's no metaphysical reality there at all, there's still this imaginative enterprise that characterizes the entire human, what, imaginative effort, cultural effort to posit a transcendent ideal that we would live in relationship to. And I, I just don't see that case being made very strongly, and I can't really understand why, because isn't it rather obvious that at least part of what Christianity has been is the attempt by thousands of people over thousands of years to specify the nature of an ideal? Certainly, I would say so, and I would say that the fact that these uh, principles uh, actually work is uh, proof of their uh, of the uh, proof of there being true accounts of what the nature of the real is. Um, but let's 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 approach this from a couple of different angles, Jordan. You know, the first is, I mean, one of the things that I I profoundly believe is that, you know, these young people seeking you know, deeper answers and you know to however much they may be flailing about, you know, it's not their fault that many, perhaps most of the institutions they will encounter will betray that which is deepest in them, will, 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 will denigrate, will tell them, no, none of, this thing, none of these things that you're seeking are really real. I mean, I think, you know, I've been talking, uh, uh, thinking a lot over the years about architecture and what is going on in brutalist architecture. And, and it really does seem to me that in brutalist architecture, I mean, to live in relation to brutalist architecture, it is as if you had a parent that said, you know, you're nothing. You're nothing. You'll never amount to any. I mean, of course, there are terrible people, terrible to say people actually, there are people in these situations who live with, with such dysfunctional uh, 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 lack of love and antagonism. This is the way that this is the, the home life that, they, that, that some people uh, terribly have. But I'm using this as an example because I think what brutalist architecture does is it declares to the whole world and to you that you are there is no truth, there is no beauty, you are nothing. Accept it. It's just a concrete, uh, 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 annihilating force. And mm -hmm. and 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 you see this culture of repudiation. I mean, here in in in, in not here, you're in Canada. I'm in the states in, in Savannah now. But you know the the Chateau Laurier. I think I misspoke recently. Called it the the Frontenac, which is in Quebec. But in, in Ottawa, you know the Chateau Laurier. There's been a a, a desire to expand this sort of beautiful sort of neo-Gothic building. Um, and it went through six rounds of approval to finally uh, be, uh, to make uh, a set of plans that would meet the local architectural uh, uh, or review board, whatever it was. And I thought, well, it can't be that bad. You know, it's gone through that. And I mean, this structure is abhorrent. It looks like a, a cross between a, a, a Verizon server farm and an American penitentiary. I mean, it is just a, a, it is a declaration that there that there is no higher order at all. 